Hey guys, welcome to this channel on Talk with Tyson. And today I am delighted to welcome an esteemed guest, Miss Amita Kanekar. Just to give you a short introduction on this famous personality. Well, she has done her research at the architectural history. She is also a visiting lecturer at the Goa College of Architecture. She has done her MPhil in architectural history. She has also wrote, written two novels, uh, which are historical fictions. Uh, also, a guidebook to the fort architecture. And she also uh, regularly writes uh, newspaper columns on architecture, history, and politics. And it's our privilege to have her today over here on this show. Miss, welcome. Thank you so much, Nancy. Yes. Well, uh, let me jump on to the questions right away. And uh, the first question for today is, what is your field of interest? Like, you know, and uh, could you explain about all what you do, the temple architecture and everything? So I've been uh, working on uh, the architecture, I mean, studying the architecture of the temples of Goa for uh, some years now, actually about three or four years. Uh, it began as an uh, as a, a kind of an urgent project uh, idea because uh, it was visible that the the temples were disappearing. Mm. That the temples are actually uh, not the temples themselves, but the architecture is disappearing. Mm. Goa has a very unique uh, kind of temple architecture, you know, which you don't it? find uh, anywhere else. Uh, it's okay. an uh, it's a heterogeneous uh, architectural style mm -hmm. which blends. Uh, ideas from Goan church architecture and thus mm. from the European Renaissance, the European Baroque. So it wow. brings those ideas and mixes them with ideas from Bijapur and Mughal architecture. Okay. And and uh, over the decades, I, probably through the 19th century, this developed into a very typical, you know, characteristic temple style which you find only in the Goan region. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's, I think it's an important part of Goan heritage. Uh, and also part of you know um, architectural history for even others to be in, you know to to uh, to study, but the tragedy is that uh, it's not regarded as he heritage in Goa today. Oh, is it? And uh, what is happening is that uh, these temples are being broken down and being renov or be they're being renovated. Either they're being completely rebuilt or they're being uh, renovated, and the result is that you don't have uh, anything that reminds you of the original architecture. Oh, In okay. fact, what you often see is that what comes up are, is replicas of ancient temple architecture from, you know, North India or South India. Oh, you know, okay, and okay, so okay. the original Goan architecture is just disappearing. Okay. Uh, so this, this, this is a kind of an ongoing tragedy which has been happening. It was slow at first in the in the seventies, and I mean, uh, yeah, it was a bit slow, I would say. And now it's very rapid. I mean, you can visit a temple in these last ten years. I myself have visited a temple the second time after a few years and find that it's completely missing and there's something else coming up. You know? Okay, okay. So, so this project began with this idea that one must document the temples before they disappear okay. but uh, as that as you know i got into it it uh, also became like a, a larger study into the into the way temples function into the way they have evolved into their chronology because there was a lot of misunderstanding about when this kind of architecture originated okay, and so it became okay. a larger project you know but okay, yes, wow. so that's okay, okay. that's cool and uh, Maybe if you could just explain the basic uh, architecture of a temple, like you know, what are the important parts? So, uh, the basic uh, sh uh, temple, Hindu temple, would be, uh, uh, you know, a sanctum. Okay. So it would be the garbakud, as it's known as the garbakud, you know, okay. the uh, the womb chamber, as you would call a sanctum sanctorum in English. Okay. So that's the basic. Uh, shrine and that normally will have a little porch so you can see this in in you know in many uh, large temples are actually uh, complexes with many shrines okay. so the smallest uh, not the smallest but some of them will be like this just a little cellar and an entrance porch and you can also see independent such shrines okay. now as the temple becomes bigger it gets a hall in front so you have the shrine and you have a hall okay. and then it's if it's bigger and then the porch okay. and then you, as, as it gets bigger you can have a shrine a hall called the mantap so okay. you have that you have the garbakud you have the mantap which is the hall 
and then you have the porch which oh. then in in grander temples can be like a balcony you know oh, okay okay uh, then you can also have a ambulatory space around the sanctum so that's mm-hmm. that pradakshina as it's known as okay okay and then um, you have ancillary structures like uh, you have the tulsi vrindavan and you have which you know which is the tuls, tulas tulas plant as we call it and uh, you also have the khamo which is the lamp tower okay. you know which is a very typical goan form okay i mean there are there are lamp uh, towers in uh, along this peninsula along the western peninsula many temples have got lamp towers okay. but the particular form that it takes in goa is very unique that it is uses the the kind of bijapuri tiered structure okay, with okay, with particular okay. kind of bijapuri arches usually okay. you know and and that's how it rises okay. so it reminds you of the bijapuri minarets mm-hmm. uh, that's so uh, so yeah so this is the this would be a typical kind of uh, temple and then it also has a prominent entrance gate which is which reminds you of the mughal palaces it's it's known as the nagar khana in fact okay. it's known even in in, in goa temples as the nagar khana and it's a place uh, where you know it's like a gatehouse so you enter through it and uh, it has a chamber above traditionally mm-hmm. it would have a chamber above where musicians used to play but you never saw the musicians because you know they were supposed to be of the untouchable caste mm-hmm. so they would play you could hear their uh, art but you never okay. saw them you know isn't yes that's how okay, it would okay, be okay. earlier so you had these grand gateways you know nagar khanas okay okay, okay. Wow. so there there were these typical uh, typical parts of a temple you know and but, but they are still there existing yeah you can see the nagar khana for example at uh, at um, kavle at the shantadurga kavle and you okay. know at some other places okay, okay. also yes nagar khanas are there at uh, veling uh, okay. the veling lakshmi narasimha so all these uh, all these parts will be there in the biggest temples oh, okay, okay okay and uh, and so you have a you have a kind of a hierarchy of temples mm-hmm. and uh, you find that the biggest and the grandest temple which also have all the typical goan forms like the dome okay. over the sanctum okay. and uh, then particular you know the 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 drum the sanctum rises like a tiered drum and over that oh. is a dome you know okay, so okay, that okay. will be found only in in the grandest of temples not okay, every tem- okay. many, many temples will just have a simple pitch roof okay you know, a okay, tile okay, roof okay. but the grandest will have this dome and you'll find that there's a caste hierarchy in these temples where most of the grand and dome temples will belong to the dominant caste oh. the saraswats you know okay. because all these temples are private institutions oh. they're owned by uh, the uh, you know by a com- by people called the mahajans Okay. Uh, so yeah so they are which is a hereditary position mm-hmm. uh, of people who claim to be the founders of the temple but that's not there's no historical okay. proof as such of that but uh, uh, so so they are private institutions and you find that and they are caste based mm-hmm. so temples are you know the mahajans are belong to a caste or sometimes to two castes so you know mm-hmm. it can be it can be it can be multiple but it's specific is specific to caste okay and you find that the biggest temples in goa generally this is not like 100% but like most of them will belong to the saraswat community okay and only to the saraswat community okay. not okay. a mixed okay. thing okay. okay that's interesting <laughs> and um, is there any portuguese influence on the goan hindu temples uh see this question has two parts one mm. uh, is that uh, i mean one is a general thing which i would like to say is that when uh, you know, people often say that is there a portuguese influence in this aspect of goa is there a portuguese influence in that aspect of goa you know like they talk about food they talk about something else music whatever uh, this religion and they say is there a portuguese influence what i want to say is that uh, the portuguese were here for uh, 450 years True. okay before that there's not much histor i mean there is a historical record but it's much much more limited than what we get from the time of the portuguese we mm-hmm. don't know like okay, a lot okay. about the architecture of the pre pre 1510 in okay, in goa okay. we know we there are some monuments yes mm-hmm. but we don't know about lots of lots of things that were happening about a lot of the houses for example about the smaller shrines okay. we know there are some like we know that there is tamri surla uh, uh, you know uh, uh, that that temple tamri surla which is in sange but uh, nobody would say that yeah there would be all the shrines in goa would be like tamri surla you know it correct, is correct. so so you see we don't know much about it so when i say that you know when people say that is there uh, would you say this portuguese influence 
first of all, 450 years is such a long time, you know, so many centuries that it's it it's almost uh, you know uh, it's almost uh, impossible to say that there would be no influence on anything. Okay. It's okay. a very long time, so they so everything would be influenced by you know by that those 450 years. Okay. It's not like you know 10 years. Somebody's <laughs> there for 10 years and went. Okay. It's a very long time. Secondly, we don't have knowledge about what's there before, not exactly. much. Exactly. So what we have knowledge of is of the present time. Present. Okay. So, uh, not present time. Sorry, of the of the of the Portuguese period onwards. The okay. documentation starts then. Okay, okay. The documentation starts then. In the sixty, we have a lot of documentation in the sixteenth century, okay. which is being studied, of course. So, uh, so therefore, you know, to say that. Uh, uh, that, that, that there is no Portuguese influence in this part of you know Goa's culture. Goa itself did not exist before 1510. Okay. Goa yeah. as a as a political entity was made by the Portuguese conquest. Before that, if you see this region that we call Goa was uh, you know was part of many king you know was parts mm -hmm. of it was part of many kingdoms. Like Kadambas did not have have all of Goa. Okay. The Shilaharas did not have all of Goa. Okay. So you know uh, Bijapur did not have all of Goa. Correct. So it's like it was bits it was scattered. But this the 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 area that we recognize today as Goa was formed in these 450 years. Okay. So okay. you know so therefore to say that there is no Portuguese influence would be I think uh, very ignorant. Obviously there will be Portuguese influence. We have to find that out. Now about temples we do know that there is portuguese influence definitely because uh, because uh, we uh, know that uh, a lot of the big temples of today i mean most of the temples that are existing today have come up in the last uh, have come up uh, before 1961 uh, mm -hmm. probably about 100 years ago maybe 150 years ago maybe maximum some of them claim to be two you know uh, claim to be 250 years old, but that's all under the Portuguese rule. Okay. You okay. see, so they have come up. Their architecture has developed in that Portuguese period. So, except for okay. Tambri Surla and and you know some monuments like that, which have which are old, mm -hmm. everything else, uh, I mean everything else or most everything else has come up within these 500 years. And even uh, though there are some temples like Nageshi and Chandreshwar Parvat, Nageshi temple is in uh, Ponda Taluka and Chandreshwar Parvat is in Kepe, uh, they have inscriptions which say that they are very old, that okay. they are before the Portuguese arrived, but their architecture is within the last 200-300 years. Oh. You see, so nobody knows what they were like then. Okay, okay, okay. Because okay. documents, records were not kept of what true, they were true, like. True, true. But they themselves now say that they were rebuilt in, you know, in the 19th century, in the 18th century. Okay. That is under the Portuguese rule. Okay. So okay, you see, okay, so the okay. what we call Goan temple architecture, architecture belongs to this Portuguese period. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that I'm also sense. calling it Goan temple architecture because it is it can be identified that way, that it belongs to the entity that was Goa. While if you look at uh, Tambri Sutla temple, for example, it is not Goan architecture. It, mm -hmm. it belongs to the family of architecture called Karnata Dravida. You know, okay. it, because it was part of the Kadamba Empire and it was influenced by the architecture that was happening in this in this uh, in that part of Karnataka which is close to Goa. Okay. Okay. So okay. it belongs to that school that that family of architecture. Okay. So okay. I refer to the to the particular architecture that came up in the last uh, uh, you know about two centuries ago onwards as as you know typically Goan temple architecture because it belongs to this place mm -hmm. uh, you know as a political entity and also chronologically to Goa mm -hmm. and also uh, has you know it, it it has that particular heterogeneity which came up in uh, Goa as a result of you know the circumstances here okay, okay so okay, so okay, that's okay. why you know that's why your Goan temple architecture can be called a, a style or a type mm -hmm. a, an architectural type true, true. Okay? okay that makes quite a bit of sense yeah, yeah. And did uh, the Portuguese help uh, renovate or kind of rebuild the temples, mm. the, the ones which were maybe lost during those times? No, uh, I'm not absolutely sure whether they helped. Uh, I mean, that is, they contributed or in that sense helped. I, uh, I mean, one, it would be interesting to find out whether there was any concrete help or finance or anything like that what is clear however is that these temples came up uh, and were renovated and rebuilt like say the like say the mangeshi temple says that it was rebuilt in around uh, 1890 
1890 or 1890s, that decade, the last decade of the 19th century, <laughs> that it was completely rebuilt. Okay. Okay. Now that is in the Portuguese era. So the Portuguese has. So what you can see is that the temples did a lot of work, rebuilt themselves, made themselves grander, and so on in the Portuguese era. I don't know whether the Portuguese, con you know, whether the government contributed. Okay. okay. But the government did contribute uh, in the sense that over the 19th century, the government made a lot of um, new laws about and rules about how the temples should function mm -hmm. because there were complaints from uh, worshippers of the temple there were complaints from various sides of certain uh, of certain um, irregularities mm -hmm. there were issues of money you know uh, and mm -hmm. properties owned by the temple so there were complaints like that during the 19th century and the, and you find that the government uh, starts uh, making certain rules about how they should how the temples should function you know mm -hmm. how they should have a committee how the uh, the property how the property papers have to be maintained and you know even treasure how the treasure or the you know the safe how that should be maintained so these rules and all come up and finally there's this very important law passed which sets up which is called the mazania law you know or the regulamento the Maz Mazanias and the Mazanias are these Mahajans. Okay. Now earlier this word Mahajan is an old word or what, what we call in Konkani we say Mazan. Okay. Mazan. So Mazan is an old word and uh, although it generally might be you know can mean great person or great man. Mm -hmm. uh, before this Mazania law, it was a loose term which meant everybody who is associated in any way with the temple, you know, so could be somebody who claimed to be a descendant of the founder, but could be somebody who also contributed a lot, okay. you know, made a donation, helped in the building. It was it was a loose term. This is what Parag Parabo, uh, who is a, a professor of history at the Goa University, points out that Mazan, the term is a vague term mm -hmm. earlier, okay. but with the Mazania law, it becomes a very clearly defined term and it says that these Mazans are uh, descendants of the founders mm -hmm. and they belong to this caste and they are the owners of the temple. Oh. Earlier it was not so clear that who is the owner of the temple. You know, oh. It was more like the local community mm -hmm. had a say and they were not these hard uh, owners. But with this law, so this is a law which actually uh, has helped uh, powerful interests mm -hmm. take over. This is what this is what Parak Parparabha also feels that those people who are who are associated with the temple, but also were literate mm -hmm. and had access to resources and so on, they were able to make these claims about being the descendants and so on. Okay. And other people may not even be aware of what is happening because okay. obviously literacy is not going to be very high among the less dominant groups. Mm -hmm. So people were able to you know uh, take over that position as we are the sole owners okay. and and that is the reason why he feels that the dominant castes have become so prominent in all temples mm -hmm. you know there are lots of temples where which which are you know in which the non dominant castes okay are who might be who might be living there in a larger community in that area they will be mazans but you'll find that saraswats are also mazans there oh. you know so this is an interesting thing where uh, saraswats are you know the dominant caste in goa saraswats and they are play a prominent the role generally in all temples besides having the biggest temples there okay. of their own okay, okay. so so this is something which the which the, which is the result of this portuguese law and it helped uh, the dominant castes a lot mm. uh, it also may have resulted in uh, the fact that there's a lot of rebuilding of temples happening around that time in the last uh, few decades of the 19th century where you know, they, they kind of become like a statement for those who are now the owners. Okay. You okay. know, so that could be, I mean, I, I associate it with that. Okay. But uh, it's also true that a lot of people in, in Goa today don't, I mean, feel that the Mazania law has to be removed. It mm -hmm. has to, it has to go because it, first of all, you know, it upholds, I mean, it's, uh, the the accuracy of what it says in the sense that these people are the descendants of the founders and, and nobody else is, is there is is questionable but more um, uh, more than that it lays down caste a uh, caste basis for everything so there's a caste of the owners there's a caste of the priests there's a caste of the people who beat the drums there's a caste of every single occupation is based on caste okay so which is doesn't fit into the modern 
you know today's world today's world today's constitution the constitution of india uh, believes you know article 15 is, uh, is is against discrimination on the basis of things like religion caste and so on mm -hmm. and this is a, an institution which a public institution which is you know uh, where a lot of people are associated with it mm -hmm. and yet there's a massive discrimination that like you can't go and you know even if you're a worshipper a genuine worshipper you can't do the same uh, rituals that somebody else can do Okay, you okay, see, okay. and that person can do it because uh, uh, he or she will say that you know we are the Mahajan family, so we can okay. go inside there. You can only go till here. You can, you cannot. In some, there are still temples in in uh, in Goa where um, if you belong to certain caste, you cannot even enter the temple. Okay. And and uh, they they don't say it publicly, but in the village it is known. So the okay. village everybody behaves like that. That yeah, we we don't go to the temple. We cannot go. Okay. You see, so this is uh, so this 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 kind of. Um, uh, enforcement of caste rights is there in that I mean is there in it doesn't lay down this thing of where you can go and so on mm -hmm. but it, it gives a lot of power to the margins okay. and it's a, it's 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 uh, based on caste and on that basis itself it should be the marginal law as many people you know like, like at this temple Navdurga at Madkai there's a demand also that of, of local villagers that this Mazania law should be overturned so it should okay, go okay, because okay, you know okay. it is it doesn't so it's still in the discussion uh, well, it's not gone to court. I, I know it is in court. Yeah, that 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 uh, that uh, fight over you know who owns the temple is in court of that temple. Okay, okay. So there have been these uh, these disputes, and so yes, the Portuguese government uh, played a big role in uh, in the in the nineteenth century, even earlier. But earlier they were more uh, you know in the sixteenth century they destroyed a lot of temples. So that that is a different period. But in the 19th century, with the current temples, they played a, a quite a lot of, uh, quite a big role uh, in regulating the temples, and uh, the result is what we have now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Speaking about uh, you know the renovations of the temple or rebuilding it, you know recently uh, Pramod Savant also in in that background he has said about like you know rebuilding the te uh, temples that were destroyed by the P Portuguese. So, what's your take on that? There are there are two aspects about it. One is that I think uh, I don't think you know he has claimed that he's putting money aside to uh, to uh, rebuild lost heritage. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in actuality he's he keeps on referring only to temples mm -hmm. because if you look at the heritage that Goa has lost in its history, we have lost so much, uh, so many shrines of so many faiths. You know, we have lost. There was a big. Uh, there was Buddhist. There were Buddhist shrines here, which have disappeared. There were Jain shrines here, which have disappeared. Uh, we know for a fact that when the Portuguese came, uh, they obliterated. They completely destroyed whatever Muslim shrines were there. In mm. fact, that was the first thing they did. After that, their, their destruction of uh, Hindu shrines came later. Mm -hmm. So Muslim shrines uh, were destroyed widely, and and you don't find uh, you know th that the chief minister is talking about all these you know all the shrines of all these faiths. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there's this other aspect that the shrines of indigenous communities have been dest destroyed and completely invisibilized in history, and they're being destroyed even today. Okay. Like Mopa, for example, for the Mopa airport, uh, it was it had come in the paper that there are sacred groves there, okay, okay which are the shrines of indigenous com communities. But mm -hmm. nobody is giving that any importance. So when they do mm -hmm. all these developments in the forests and so on, so many shrines get wiped out. But mm -hmm. nobody is, you know, uh, gives that importance. Why doesn't, you know, if he really wants to uh, protect shrines, he could even see what is happening right now and try to protect those sacred, mm -hmm. you know, sacred spots. But uh, he seems to be only bothered about the Hindu shrines, which are destroyed by the Portuguese at that time. You know, oh. so so in that sense, there is a. Uh, it seems uh, um, that you know it's it's uh, it's a political kind of strategy to I feel uh, to spread a, a communal divide you know to increase the communal divide because uh, the other thing is that when he speaks about you know restore shrines what is what exactly is he talking about I, like I said I I believe that Goan architectural heritage is worth preserving mm -hmm. but if you look at the way the government has encouraged renovation and rebuilding. Nowadays, th these projects of renovation and rebuilding, a lot of them are getting funding from the government. Okay. You know, this is what temple committees have told him that there are, there are, you know, there are, uh, there is government funding for beautification of areas and beautification of uh, localities, temple localities, and they're developing, like in the Bicholi area, for example, they're developing temple areas uh, for tourism, mm. and and part of that funding is going into just rebuilding the whole temple. You know, okay. so the government is not interested in restoring and preserving the heritage of today. 
Oh, oh. It is, you know, it, it's its role is that it's it is acting like a funder and an encourager of, uh, t- you know, towards the loss of heritage. Mm-hmm. So I don't think this this idea that we should, you know, uh, restore our lost heritage is a serious issue because you would be bothered about what is happening today also. So that is not happening. So what are you? What exactly is this talk about? It's really it seems to be only about spreading, uh, you know, widening uh, co- communal issues and targeting the minorities. Okay, tar- because you know this this whole thing of temple destruction is something which is you know which works for uh, this kind of divisive politics because you know you can uh, you can talk about the past and talk about destruction and violence of the past and make people forget about what the destruction and violence is happening now okay like for example the destruction of indigenous communities livelihoods uh, the destruction of farming the you know the destruction of the forest the the uh, the lack of jobs you know the destruction of traditional uh, jobs and the lack of new jobs there's so much there's so much violence in our society today you know s- subtle violence which is mm. ruining people's lives but so by talking about this violence of 500 years ago you can go on making people angry about that okay yeah. that's one thing you can do secondly by focusing on uh, the Portuguese or, or you know Muslim kings you can sort of target the communities today and act as though they are responsible for what some co religionists did a long time ago so that becomes a way of creating divides and I think thirdly is that you can even maybe create uh, real estate projects you know building mm-hmm. projects which of course the, uh, the real the construction industry is only too interested in more and more building so it's a it is a I mean there's nothing positive about it for uh, for Goa at all this idea and and uh, I mean uh, a connected point is that you know it's it doesn't make sense even logically because if you see uh, the idea that uh, only uh, that you know uh, that only the Portuguese destroyed shrines is historically false okay. shrines have been destroyed of different faiths have been destroyed by rulers of other faiths throughout the world and throughout uh, I- India as well I mean mm-hmm. Uh, even you know th- there are there are records which say that some of the biggest temples of India were built on Buddhist shrines, on Buddhist Ooh, sites. Okay, okay? Okay, okay, I was told at the Sringeri temple by a priest there that this is a the originally a Jain shrine. Okay. I mean a Jain site, you know, and then the Sringeri temple came up. Similarly, many scholars have said that uh, the Tirupati shrine is a is a si- is a Buddhist site originally. Okay. You know, so this uh, and and similarly this uh, the, at Karla, you know, when you go to the Karla caves, which is a famous Buddhist site in uh, near Lonavala in Maharashtra, there you see multiple shrines kind of overlapping and still existing. There are indigenous tribal shrines. There is the Buddhist shrine, and now there is a Hindu shrine. Mm. All together, you know, you can see the overlap, and it's it's like they are kind of jostling for attention, mm. you know. So the the point is that that shrines have been destroyed by people by rulers who belong to other faiths, and they have very often put a new shrine there because you know sites are considered sacred. Mm. Normally, when you if, if a shrine is destroyed, people will not just leave it and you know let anything come up there. Yeah. They will put a shrine there. So mm. it is normal to find that on the site of some destroyed shrine, there will be another shrine mm. anywhere in the world. And so when you talk about we are going to restore that, you are talking about destruction. Mm. You know, you are you are always talking about destruction instead of respecting the fact that at that time people did such things to show power. They did such things to show conquest. Mm-hmm. You no, know, they did such things for whatever whatever reason, you know, whatever justification they had now we don't believe in that right mm-hmm. now we look at the past uh, you know in order to understand the present better but to go to the past and and try to remove what happened historically mm-hmm. is something which is impossible you cannot remove history what you can do is destroy the present oh, yeah. you know so so this talk of uh, of rebuilding uh, shrines which were destroyed is really i think uh, it, it's a political ploy which which uh, which is not going to benefit uh, temple architecture mm-hmm. it's not going to benefit genuine worshippers it's just going to create uh, you know divis- uh, it's going to divide society and create anger and also give a you know encourage people who are anyway c- you know creating trouble like at the you know at the sankwal frontispiece already there are some you know some people there who have been uh, who have been found you know saying that we should destroy this architectural monument because there was a temple here and so on so you know you're you're encouraging this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, of you know destructive behavior so i think i think uh, i mean uh, the chief minister is really trying to distract attention from real problems by talking mm-hmm. about uh, temples of the past i mean it's it's a it's a political ploy
Okay. So finally, like you know, what kind of architecture I would say, like you know, you would like to see in these temples? Like now, there are a lot of temples that are going to be rebuilt. Like one great example is the one which is in Verna. I guess it's called the Maha Mahalsa Temple. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, like how you have mentioned, most of these temples are losing its original kind of taste of architecturing. So, what would you like to see in those? See, uh, uh, I think uh, that the Goan Temple needs uh, both protection as well as reform. Okay. It needs protection in its architecture. Okay. okay the, the physical architecture, uh, the, you know, the, the, yeah, the physical form of the temple is unique. Mm -hmm. And it also reflects a certain, uh, you know, a, uh, it reflects Goan culture in the sense that it reflects the cosmopolitanism. It, it, has, it has inspiration from so many different kinds of architecture and it's mm -hmm. come together in a very unique manner. Mm -hmm. So just like, you know, we try to preserve uh, uh, elements of of your heritage and especially architecture when it it is clearly you know showing something about the past it's not it's not just it's not ordinary architecture it's it's grand architecture and it's also showing something you know making a statement about how the past was mm -hmm. so that's what you call heritage so um, uh, so in that sense i feel that the architecture should be preserved and what is happening now should be stopped because what is happening now is that uh, you know in this general climate of today uh, this kind of heterogeneous architecture is not liked people Ooh. don't like you know this heter uh, what they would like is something that does not show any influence of uh, any other faith you know okay. Okay. this is the problem now architecture is not like this see architecture historically has never been bound to any religion today mm -hmm. people talk about hindu architecture muslim architecture christian mm -hmm. architecture True. it was not like this if you go back you'll find that all over the world huh, there are mosques for example there are there are uh, there are muslim shrines which look very different from each other if you okay. see them in china you see them in russia you see them in uh, Saudi Arabia, whatever, the architecture is completely different. It's of the place. And in fact, you find more and more that people are trying to be as, not in fact, not now also, even in the past, they want it to be as grand and as fashionable as possible. Okay. Similarly, temples of the past, look at Shivaji's temples, the, 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 the temples that the Marathas put up, mm -hmm. they are not trying to imitate those, um, you know, Gujarat temples or Khajurao temples or, you know, uh, Chola temples, they are imitating the, uh, they, are, they are inspired by the Bijapur and the Mughal architecture that time. Okay, you know, okay, so okay. they they have all the, you know, they have the Mughal arches, they have the Mughal domes, they have, uh, you know, they have um, Bijapuri forms. You mm -hmm. see, so, so it, and this I, I found, I did my MPhil on the Ikeri Naikas, you know, their architecture in, in Karnataka. They also are totally inspired by Bijapur. Now, why are they, what is this inspiration coming from? It's actually the way today also people are inspired by whoever seems to be, you know, uh, more powerful, grander, more, fa you know, and therefore fashionable. And so you imitate what, whoever you feel that you want to be like. Mm -hmm. Or it's also about showing your association that, you know, we are connected. Okay, okay, we are connected, okay. we are not some nobody, we are connected. So architecture okay. always has been like that. It takes influence, you know, mm. it's not, uh, it takes influence from whoever and show. And, you know, it's also a way, I mean, everybody knows that architecture has been a way for rulers to show how mm. great they are, you know. So it's yeah. about rulers showing off. They build a okay, great okay, okay. building, they show off. So uh, that connections are also made in that kind of architecture. And there was no, nothing like, I mean, when you have, a Bijapuri dome. People didn't say, oh, this is a Muslim architecture. This is a temple mm -hmm. and this is a grand temple and that's why we are going for a dome because we have that much money. Okay, we okay. have that much, you know, we have that much, uh, we, are, we are so worldly wise, we are so cosmopolitan. Okay, yeah, okay, and that's okay. why we are going for a grand dome and then people are around say, wow, you know, that's that's how, you know, that's really grand. Okay. So uh, today we are trying to, com cut, you know, compartmentalize this architecture. And, mm -hmm. and uh, for example, at one temple I was told, when I asked, I said, this temple had a dome. I know, I've seen the photos of it. And now it doesn't, now it has a pitch roof. And that person there tells me, a Muslim at a dome, you know. Oh. So it's like yeah, that architectural form is, is being restricted to a faith, yeah. you know, which is very, uh, which is very ahistorical. That is not how it was. Mm. <laughs> so n because of that, you find, and you know, because of that, uh, th this is the attitude that you generally see. Uh, I think in India as a whole nowadays, but uh, Goans feel, uh, uh, you know, Goans feel that, yeah, I mean, Goans also following that thing that, yeah, yeah we also should have temples which look like temples mm -hmm. that don't remind you of Muslim this and Christian this, you know.
so they are feeling that you know that's not this is ours doesn't look like a temple so what i've actually heard people saying that a dome and all doesn't look like a temple so they want to have so they are making uh, imitations of north indian temple architecture and south indian temple architecture in concrete okay you know so you have for example the damodar temple at zambauli uh, which was completely rebuilt in the 70s 1970s okay. it had a typical goan architecture before that you know and there okay. are black and white photos of it and so on but now it is a replica of uh, of the nagara style of north india in oh. rcc yeah so that what is there what was there earlier has completely gone mm. and and this was this was happening with many temples now what is happening is that uh, to some extent because of mass tourism and all that and and you know you have tourists tourists coming and they're looking for the goan kind of experience so in that goan experience this indo portuguese architecture has also become very touristy oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the whole tourism market is selling indo portuguese indo portuguese which actually okay. has no meaning mm-hmm. meaning okay. what they call indo portuguese actually goan correct you know it is you won't find this in portugal correct you find won't find this in the rest of india it is goan so they but they're selling it you know giving it that european this by saying indo portuguese so people are tourists are kind of they want to consume that indo portuguese architecture mm. so as a result you find the the rebuilding which is happening in the last you know 20 years or so and it's increased like anything i mean the amount of rebuilding is massive now but they all are giving a little bit of these golden touches like you know a, a white edging okay. a little bit of a dome but that dome will not be a golden dome it will be some other weird dome but they'll put a dome they'll put some balustrade so you know some things which I and pitch roofs so it will look vaguely like there's something which reminds you of this uh, but it's like not right mm-hmm. it's not right it's not the goan architecture it's but it has a touch of goan architecture somewhere so there's that uh, there's that uh, real mix now which is happening but it, and it's at a much grander and lavish scale and lots of the lots of lavish uh, materials which is which is uh, i mean it's really sad you know it's really sad because mm-hmm. what is lost is something you'll never get back so i try to tell uh, people you know who who are part of committees of temples that what you lose i mean what you're building now in rcc is so easy to get and so easy to rebuild but what you've lost which is built in mud and laterite and those mm-hmm. particular forms and that barrel vault and that dome and so you'll never get back that mm-hmm. you can never that that is gone that's what's called heritage that you that you'll you'll lose it and you'll never get it back mm-hmm. so instead that should be preserved i really think that they should be preserved but uh, but it's but you know where there was like some of the big temples were uh, heritage mm-hmm. uh, institutions you know after 1961 mm-hmm. even before 1961 but after 1961 some of them were listed as heritage monuments which could not be changed but they got themselves removed oh. yeah and they don't so now very few temples there are a few uh, which are still listed but very few most okay. of them are removed and they are renovating like mad Yeah. So that's so that's uh, so there that's one aspect of the temple which I think is really important I mean it's a, it's a losing battle but still whatever is left we should try to preserve it that I really do mm-hmm. think so and the second thing which I think about the temple which needs to be reformed is this casteist uh, the fact that it's an institution of caste okay it really upholds caste you know in every aspect <laughs> so uh, and it gives that sanction or a religious sanction to caste okay you know okay, okay, okay. it's one thing that you have caste in society and so on but when you have that religious sanction to caste the dominant caste can enter the garba code can enter the mm-hmm. sanctum mm-hmm. the non dominant caste are a little outside and those who are considered the lowest caste so called lowest caste they are the mm-hmm. most outside oh. you know when you have all that that is you are giving a religious sanction to caste and when we say that caste is you know dividing society it's creating hierarchies if we don't if we accept that caste is something which is not it doesn't fit into our idea of you know liberty equality uh, fraternity then caste is something which we have to fight against and 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 the the temple functioning needs to be reformed on this the tragedy is that you have this you know totally fancy new architecture coming up mm-hmm. which which is uh, however it's it, it's it's new in the sense that it's it's using all new materials and it's glittering you know in very mm. uh, luxurious you know silver gold granite marble all that but uh, it it contains all the old ideas about society you know society mm-hmm. it, it's upholding all that old ideas and in a way because its forms are also you know its forms are uh, inspired by ancient uh, indian architecture mm-hmm. so that matches that so you're going kind of back in your forms okay. and that matches the kind of society that your that the institution upholds so so i think i think the temples need to be reformed in how they function Uh, but their architecture is heritage and needs to be the original goan architecture is heritage and needs to be protected, protected. okay
well that's <laughs> quite a lot of insights and even it has made me think like you know because it, it used to come to me in my mind as well like every time i used to see churches when i was small um why the why why only churches were like you know structured in that particular manner uh, why temples were structured so differently mosques so differently and also the colors you know churches mm-hmm. associated with white yeah. temple with orange uh, mosque maybe with green and all and yeah this uh, really refreshed my thoughts uh, with what you shared and uh, i hope uh, some of our viewers also has enjoyed some of these fresh insights and uh, once again thank you for being with us on this channel yes. and uh, please do subscribe to this channel to receive some more content and we'll be back soon uh, very soon so till then goodbye take care thanks a lot <laughs> thank you thank you